Do you like books? Do you like online book clubs? Do you like debating senselessly over the finer points of literature? Well, welcome to Chapter Chats. My name is Aries. My favorite animal is a dog. My favorite book is Tuesdays with Maury. My Hogwarts house is Gryffindor. My name's Echo. My favorite animal is by far a cow. My favorite book is I'll Give You the Sun by Jandy Nelson. And my Hogwarts house is Ravenclaw. My name is Kate. My favorite animal is a panda. My favorite book is Paper Towns. And my Hogwarts house is Hufflepuff. I know. What, <laughs> what are we? <laughs> oh, good. For our first podcast, we decided to read To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, which was published in 1960s. It's about a case of a black man supposedly raping a white woman in the time period of the 1930s where racism was arguably at its all-time high. What I want to talk about is why this book became so popular. Do you guys have any thoughts on this? In my opinion, it's definitely because of Scout's point of view. I don't believe that the book ever would have became popular if it wasn't in Scout's point of view. For example, she was a child and she brought so much innocence to this mad world of politica- t- politics politics, politics, that was brought upon her with her father as a lawyer. And she had so much innocence, she didn't really understand everything that was going on. When they confronted Atticus at the jail cell, she called out Mr. Cunningham and... The reason they really left the jail was because a child called them out on their petty ways. And the book got published in 1960s, where racism was still a huge issue. And if it was a grown white man character as Atticus calling out all these issues, it would have been a lot different than Scout going through this as a child. I like how you called a lynch mob petty. <laughs> That's my favorite part of that entire speech. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I do think... I don't think it was Scout being a child so much as the time when it was published. Because it was published in 1962. Like, 60s. during... It was 1962. Um, 1960. I'm gonna fight you. <laughs> I'm going to end this argument. The copyright says 1960. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, at the height of the uh, civil rights movement, I think a lot of people were searching for a way to articulate that kind of oppression and discrimination that they were facing. And then this book kind of helped them do that. Why do you think Harper Lee did not publish another book until her deathbed. They wanted the money, basically. They say that this is based off her life story. Mm -hmm. So if it was, if she made a second book, she would have to kind of make it up as she went instead of having a basis already set out. Like, she wanted to get her story out, and once she got it out, she didn't really need to get another one out. Well, she did write another book. It's called... Go set a watchman. Um, and I have not read it yet. And in fact, I might read it next. I know a little bit about it. It's, it's supposed to take a place way later in Scott's life. And apparently it's not as good. I've never, I've not yet read it. But. Yeah, I've heard it's nothing compared to this one. Yeah, this I've also heard. Better. Atticus is a real racist in it, so looking forward to that. If you guys have any thoughts on Ghost of Watchmen, go ahead and comment below and let us hear your thoughts, because we know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while we're talking about Scout's point of view, I wanted to point out something that I had noticed, and it wasn't until I read it a second or third time that I noticed this, that The point of view of Scout changes. Sometimes it is a current happening. She's talking in present tense. And then sometimes she's talking in past tense as if she's looking back on what has happened. 
and it was pretty interchangeable and sometimes it was hard to notice. You really have to look out for it. But how did, did you guys notice this? How did this change your perception as a reader, as an audience member? Um, I didn't notice it changing to first, well, it was always in first person. I didn't notice it changing to like present tense. I just always thought it was her looking back on it and telling the events as they happened, but also in putting her own opinion on what might have happened when she was older, after she was looking back on it. So what I noticed about the movie, a lot of the point of view is Scout versus Atticus. So Scout would show things of a point of view in like a little kid's point of view, and like even the music would be cheerful. And then it would switch and it would be more of Atticus's point of view and in an adult point of view especially around the case, like every time the case was brought up, it seemed like it was in Atticus's point of view, and then every time Boo Radley was brought up, it was in Scout's point of view. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, in the book, we kind of focused on Scout because it was in that first person limited. What I noticed was the first part of the book was mostly about scout's life and it was setting up all the changes that were to come and what everyone's kind of like personalities were but as we shifted to uh the second part of the book it started to really go in on Atticus and what he was doing so it kind of shifted the subject of the book as we went to the court case and learned all about that I do think those two parts were necessary, especially part one. Part one definitely, like you said, built up the characters. It showed Scout's home life. It sent the setting. Like It was showing you what life was like in Maycomb before it went to the court case, so that when it got to the court case, you could understand the point of views of everyone sitting in that courtroom. One prominent thing about Maycomb is that it is a real racist. So let's look at the big picture here. Racism. The town is definitely racist, but it's not special to that town. It is The setting is the 1930s, and it is in Alabama. The deep I think south. everyone is pretty racist at this point in time, but I don't think that's a Maycomb focused. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but we still need to go into why they're racist. <laughs> <laughs> um... They generally look down at the, like, black population as, like, stupid children, basically. Or, like, vile, evil rapists and murderers. I actually agree. Uh, when Atticus was saying his closing statement in the court case, he said, for the witnesses for the state, with the exception of the sheriff of Macomb County, have presented themselves to you gentlemen, to this court, and the cynical confidence that their testimony would not be doubted, confident that you gentlemen would go along with them on the assumption, the evil assumption, that all Negroes lie, that all Negroes are basically immoral beings, that all Negro men are not to be trusted around their women, on assumption that one associates with the minds of their caliber. And then later on, he says, you know the truth, and the truth is this. Some Negroes lie, some Negroes are immoral, some Negro men are not to be trusted around women, black or white. So I wanted to point this out because Atticus points this out for a reason. Most of Maycomb County believes the black race as a big picture is extremely negative in the eyes of most of those citizens. I mean... I'm not really going to argue that there's not racism in this book. You so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not going to say there isn't, because there obviously is. Kate, what's your opinion? Yes, tell us your opinion, Kate. <laughs> um, so I definitely agree that there's racism, and it's shown throughout the book. <laughs> <laughs> so one part that stood out to me was when Tom Robinson was shot when he was running away. Now, in the book, they said that they shot off a warning shot, 
and then he was shot 17 times. Now, obviously, you don't need to shoot someone 17 times to stop them from running away. And in the movie, they said that they meant to shoot him in the arm and then just shot him dead. So, obviously, I don't think that was an accident, actually shooting him instead of shooting him in the arm to stop him. So I don't think that there was any accident whatsoever. And the racist part about this was that he was shot 17 times. According to the book, the prison guards had shouted out warning, uh, warnings. They were like, you need to stop. Like, get back. And then they shot off warning shots. And then they shot him. The racist part was they shot him 17 times. Would they have shot Tom Robinson 17 times if he was a white male? And that's kind of some of the things we have to consider here. I think that there are definitely ways to incapacitate someone without killing them. And it's very clear that they were intending to kill him because they could have just gone for his legs if they really wanted to stop him. If he was climbing a fence, you really need your legs for that. So, or either way you look at it. Yeah, it's just kind of something that's there and you can't argue it. You just have to look at it and think about it. Like this next point, uh, Aunt Alexandra and her missionary society are always talking about this African tribe and how they need the light of Jesus and that poor old Jay Grimes is doing his best over there, giving him the white man's perspective. And kind of just using another form of racism called the white savior complex, which means that they look down on uh, people of color as if they are like children or savages when really they don't just understand someone's culture or their uh, mannerisms. I'm going to switch course a little bit. Um, and then we can come back to this later. You were saying uh, children and savages, and it reminded me of Bob and Mayella. Uh, the Ewells, their children were treated like savages through every citizen in Macomb County. They were treated like animals. They, they lived like animals. So I wanted to discuss the Ewell family and Bob and Mayella's relationship and Mayella's relationship with the rest of the children. Do you mean Ewell? Yes, the <laughs> Ewells. I've never pronounced it correctly, but that's okay. Okay, so I'm going to go in saying that I think Mayella was more of a mom to all the children. She was the one that took care of them while her father was off getting drunk. He obviously had a very poor relationship with all his children, even though they only focus on Mayella's. I take it as far to say that Mayella may have even been the mother of some of these children. I would not doubt it. <laughs> yeah, because during the court case, she's 19, and she said her mother has been gone a long time. And there are, what, how many, eight Yule children running around? That's a lot of children for a mother that's been gone a long time. And even Atticus alludes to, like, abuse in the Yule right, And they house. say, like, there's always little faces popping up in the window. How little are those faces? Are yeah. they, like... Oh, God, this is giving me the strongest, grossest chills. Yeah, there's definitely some finer details that are not shown about Bob and Mayella. The abuse is definitely there. Uh, I fully agree that Tom Robinson was innocent for this court case. And Mayella was beaten. And it could not have been by Tom because she was struck by a left hand. And Tom Robinson has no left hand. A point I want to bring out real quick. The This is completely random. But in the book, it says that his left hand is 12 inches shorter than his right hand right arm, rather, and he looks crippled. In the movie, 
he has two normal looking arms and hands and he just can't use it functionally. I just wanted to point that out. It was a difference I noticed. Yeah, they, they can't just like I know incapacitate an actor. And I used incapacitate kind of wrongly, but that's okay. I know I understand I just wanted to say something I caught. Let's go back to Tom Robinson's family. This is during the Great Depression, so I understand that it was hard to work. But after Tom Robinson got accused of doing all this stuff, everyone was saying how they didn't want to hire his wife, Helen, for what had happened. And what are your thoughts on this? I think it happened like that because in Maycomb, uh, the kind of social aspect is really defined by what family you come from, and you're kind of stuck with that there. So when it came out about Tom Robinson going to trial for rape, no one wanted to hire her because she'd have that association. Do you think that if Helen and Tom were a white family... Do you think that same association would apply if Tom Robinson was white and he raped Mayella? Would Helen still have that prejudice against her? Or would she have the pity and empathy from the town? I definitely think that no one would want to hire her still because of that association. But I believe that if she was white, she would have received maybe a little bit more pity when her husband died if they believed that like, even if he was guilty, if the jury believed he was guilty, I still believe there's people in the town that would have went along with his side and that she would receive more than if she, as a colored woman. But I still think that whole entire social aspect of being from a family with someone who raped someone would still be there, even as a white person. I agree, and I want to, I'm going to take this moment to transition yet again to another subject, how language coincides with prejudice. There was a lot of prejudice seen throughout the movie, or throughout the book, rather, sorry, I haven't watched the movie yet. This book is definitely racist, as we have decided. Um, so let's take a look at the language. The N-word was thrown around a lot, um, that could have been just been the time period, but it was definitely persistent in the language to describe these African Americans. And there was a couple there was a couple other slang words used, but I don't have them memorized at the top of my head, but they're there. Um so yeah, there was also they weren't just describing African Americans with this prejudice language. At one point they were taking a quick break, uh Jem not Jem, Scout and Dill. They were taking a quick break from the court and they went outside and they were talking to Adolphus Raymond. And earlier in the chapter, they were talking how Adolphus Raymond was perceived as trash because they wanted to be married, but they couldn't because of the time period. Blacks couldn't marry whites yet. I guess there was association with the African Americans in this um, prejudice, but they were describing a white man. So let's talk about the prejudice involved between anything really the language and prejudice <laughs> um i think anyone who found themselves involved kind of like and protecting uh black folk or were attacked for that like as we see with Atticus about how he's taking up the court case to defend Tom Robinson and uh, Adolphus Raymond, who loves a black woman and has mixed children. Also, um, Aunt Alexandria always like looked down at Cal. Aunt Alexandria, when she moved in, she she thought that Aunt Aunt. Aunt oh, Aunt Alexandria thought that she would be enough to finish raising Scout. Um, she was very persistent on the fact that she did not like that Jem and Scout went to Calpurnia to church that day. She did not like Calpurnia bringing up Jem and Scout. And 
In Alexandria thought that she would do a much better job, and Atticus was very persistent on the fact that Cal needed to stay, and in Alexandria did not take that well at all. I think I want to transition over to uh, talk about the Loving case, since we talked about Dolphus Raymond and his uh, black girlfriend, I guess. Uh, the Loving case was a Supreme Court case back in the 60s. Um, where a black woman and a white man wanted to get married and had children, but in the state of Virginia, they weren't allowed. So they went to D.C. to get married, and they did, but they were arrested when they got back to Virginia. And it's kind of like a very important case of the time. It kind of set a mood or tone, I guess, for civil rights for Supreme Court cases. I'm glad you brought that up. Alphys Raymond is a white male with a black woman, and they have mixed children. Um, in the Loving case, was that the same, or was it different? Um, it was the same. The woman was black, and the man was white. I want to bring up a point that if I believe if the woman would have been white instead of the man, then the case wouldn't have went nearly as far. Yeah, I think I think if it were that, it probably wouldn't have played out the way that that the loving case played out. For the reason that people always look to respect a white man more than a black man. So if it was a black man and a white woman, it would not have gone well because it's two minority groups going for equal rights, and that wouldn't have worked out. I also want to bring up the Emmett Till case. Um, Emmett Till got murdered for whistling at a white woman. He Emmett Till was a black teenager. Uh, he was an African American from Chicago, and he visited the Deep South. And he was accused of whistling at Carolyn. I cannot remember her last name. I apologize. Um, later, he was, like, beat to death by a gang of white men. I wanted to bring this up because recently, on Carolyn's deathbed, she let out that her accusations were false. Uh, she made it up. And Emmett Till was beat to death for literally nothing for a lie that a white woman had. So, the amount of influence that a white woman had at that time was extremely, extremely greatly influential. Um, you can look at that in the Tom Robinson case as well. Tom Robinson was found guilty even though Mayella was lying about what had happened. And I just wanted to bring that up. Another really relevant case to this book was the uh, Scottsboro Boys case. It was basically, I think it was nine teenage boys. They were on a train car, and uh, a white man, or a white teenager, stepped on one of their hands, and a fight ensued, and it went to court because a two white women claimed that the group of black teenagers raped them, though there was insufficient evidence all but, I think, one of these boys went to jail for a while, and then it came out that they didn't do this. One of the white women confessed that they didn't do this, and they still weren't released for a while. So that's really irrelevant to this case, because you can definitely see the parallels between the Tom Robinson case and the Scottsboro case. I want to bring up what happened if Tom Robinson lived if he did not try running from the prison and he got that second case with Atticus what do you think would have happened in my opinion I honestly think that Mayella would have cracked if they had time to think of more ways to kind of dig under her skin and make her let the truth out about her father and about Tom Robinson, I think that the case could have took a better turn. I disagree. 
I think that it is possible that Mayla would have cracked, but I think Tom still would have been put to death before she cracked. I, I think death was inevitable in Tom Robinson's case because once you get in that time period, once you get accused of that, there was really no going back for him. And he kind of knew that when he tried running away. Yeah, I agree with Echo on this point. I don't, I don't think that Tom Robinson would have been set free. I think he would have probably been put to death before Mayala cracked. Yeah, there is really no good outcome for Tom Robinson in this case, and he kind of knew that, and I don't know. He, He already knew that the fate wasn't in his hands for the fate he wanted. That's why he ran. Okay, I can understand that. I want to um, go back to Bob and Mayla's relationship. We had talked about it earlier. How Bob is so abusive to Mayla, and there's so many kids there. Uh, I wanted to compare Bob and Mayla's relationship to Scott and Atticus. Because Mayla and Scout are both young ladies. Neither of them grew out with any sisters or a mother. But the, the change in parenting between Bob and Atticus is so great. And these two girls grew up so different. So I want to take a look at this. Definitely. Atticus kind of treated Scout not really like a child, but like a like an adult. He answered whatever question she asked. Uh, he reasoned through. He always explained himself. He always talked with her. But in that same regard, he acted like a parent should. He supported some of the things that you did, didn't support some of the uh, kind of bad childish things that she did, like trying to spoo on, spoo? Spy on Boo Radley. And they just spent a lot of quality time together. He definitely wanted her to grow as a person, and he wanted her to be like a successful member of society one day, whereas Mayella... Well, we all can agree that Bob Ewell, 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 (laughs) is a terrible father. We can all agree that. But is Atticus a good father? For those points you brought up, he does treat her like an adult a lot. And there's some very strong opinions um, from Atticus's sister, Anne Alexandria, whether or not he's a good father and whether that Scout and Jem were raised right. Personally, I think Atticus did a decent job as a father. He did what he could. His wife died. He didn't really know what to do, um, so he did it the best he could. Um, Everyone parents differently, and in this case, I think Atticus was a good father. I think being a good anything is kind of subjective, but in this case, I think he was a pretty decent father. He provided emotional support. He let them learn their lessons, let them make mistakes. But one of his downfalls was that he didn't worry as much as he should have. Like with all the threats that Bob Ewell was making. And in the end, he went after Atticus's children. And he didn't take kind of that threat seriously. Right, like... What I was thinking as I was reading and watching was why he would let them walk so far alone when all these threats were being made towards the children, especially. Yeah, Atticus did brush that off. He had he had seen a lot of things in his days as a lawyer, but I don't think his children have ever been threatened like that. I don't know if he just didn't know how to take it, he didn't know how to handle it, or if... He thought it was no big deal because he's seen threats like that against himself. But you're right. He should have worried more about anything, really. Uh, Dill just came out of nowhere sometimes. And when he got adopted by a new family... He didn't get adopted. (laughs) Didn't he, though? He said he had a new father and a new family. And that... Step me? No, it was a stepfather. (laughs) I never made that connection. I thought he got adopted. Um, because, like, with this new family, he got a new house and he moved 
somewhere new and this new family always brought him new toys and new books and that he was upset because they were never interested in him. I always assumed that he got passed from family to family, especially since he visited Miss Rachel each summer. That he just got passed from family member to family member and he finally got adopted. And then he ran away because he didn't like this adopted family. Because he did say that um, he didn't like this new home because his... He's, I believe he said new parents. I'll have to go back and look. I'll keep you guys updated. But they they would just buy him thing after thing and he was a little spoiled. But he didn't want all these things because they would say, you have this new book. Go read it. You have this new toy. Go play with it. They didn't want to spend time with him. And he got very upset by this and ran away. So I just assumed he got adopted, finally. Um, no, I don't think... <laughs> it's a, like, harsh your parade, I guess. I don't think that's a phrase. Anyways, um, his aunt, Rachel, when he gets back to Meridian, they have, or when he gets back to Maycomb, they have him call or write or something to his parents to tell him that he's all right and it's only a rumor that francis scout's second cousin is saying about dale to get her goat so i just brought up the page and i suppose you're right it could have been a stepfather i'm not seeing anything about his mother but this there definitely is a new father figure yeah, so I, I apologize. I always was under the impression he got adopted. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, guys, I do apologize for thinking Dill was adopted. That was completely a misconception on my part. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> on another completely random note, do you guys think that Boo Radley is creepy? No, why? <laughs> I think he's a hella creepy because if you think about it he just kind of sits in his house all day and but he's been the one putting all these things in the tree for the children he's the one like he whittled dolls wooden doll soap dolls I don't remember which one it was of, so, that he whittled soap dolls of Gem and Scout and he's always, he seems like obsessed with them. Especially in the end when, well, he did save their life from Bob Ewell. Ewell? Ewell? <laughs> uh, but it was just creepy that he was there. He was, he was just always there. So why don't you think he's creepy, Harry? <laughs> uh, I don't think he's creepy because he's just been locked up in his house for so long that he's kind of missed out on learning social interaction, especially with, like, children that are younger than him. And it's not like he was stalking them in the final scene. He heard them scream, and then he came out to save them. Fair enough. Uh, How did he already have a knife on him, though, if he wasn't stalking them? Because he heard the scream and ran out with a knife. Okay. I'm down. While we're talking about the Radleys, I would like to discuss Mr. Radley himself. It is my personal opinion that he is a raging alcoholic <laughs> and abusive drunk. Um, you don't get to see much of him past the first couple chapters because he passes away. But every single morning at 11.30 sharp, he went to town to get what the kids assumed was groceries, and that could just be Scout and Jem's innocent minds assuming they're groceries, because he carries them back in a brown paper bag. And later in the book, when they're talking about brown paper bags, it is Dalphus Raymond who has this brown paper bag, and everyone thinks he's drunk because he's sipping from it all day. So if they perceive Dalphus is drunk all the time, why couldn't Mr. Radley... So, in conclusion um, of this topic, he definitely is a raging drunk. He is um, not. <laughs> not. Just because he's carrying a brown paper bag. Well, there's other things that 
point to it as well. Like he's wait, so he's saying he is a raging he alcoholic, is. or he is pretending to be a raging alcoholic? No, he is. There's a reason he locks his kids up in his house, and that could just be maybe another- because he stabbed him. Well, there's also a reason that he stabbed him. Boo Radley stabbed his father with scissors for a reason. Because he locked him up. Because he was drunk. He didn't want this to get out. Because Boo was drunk? No, because Mr. Radley was drunk. Um, I'm going to reject that because (laughs) I'm putting my own theory Mr. Radley locked Boo up because he was gay. Ha! Beat that. Boo Radley was gay? Yes. That's my personal theory. Do you have any evidence to back up your claim? No. Do you have any evidence that I'm gay? No. Fight me. (laughs) (laughs) You need evidence. She's got a point. I know I got a point. (laughs) Alright, wrap it up. <laughs> Alright, so we want to know your guys' opinions on this. Was Mr. Radley a raging alcoholic or was he completely sober in his adventures? And reread the chapters a couple times and let, let us know your opinions. Or if he's gay. No, or if Boo is gay. Is Boo, Boo gay? gay? Is Boo gay, or is Mr. Radley a raging drunk? It is Pride Month, so... Happy Pride, Boo Radley. <laughs> um, now we're gonna wrap up. That this is Thank you for joining us in our first Pat podcast. Yes. Um, I'd like to say that our next book is going to be Animal Farm by George Orwell, which is a quick read. That's gonna be easy. Um, and a few housekeeping tips. You can find us on Twitter at, at, uh, Chapter Chats. You can find us on, uh, Instagram as, uh, Chapter Chats. And you can find our, uh, blog as chapterchats.weebly.com. If you'd like to get us, get to know us a little bit more, we also have a separate website if you're interested. PM us, DM us, do whatever you need to do, and you can get to know us a little bit more. Um, Thanks for joining us. I'm Aries. I'm Echo. I'm Kate. This has been Chapter Chats. Bye. Yo, peace.